Welcome back to Shannon's Lumber Industry Update. It's episode 69, dude. Sorry, had to be done. I'm going to call this one, So You Have a Log. What now? <laughs> I've got a, several questions about folks who have logs in a state ready to be sawn or maybe have just sawn, etc. So we're going to go back up the supply chain a little bit and talk about all of you uh, blossoming urban sawyers, micro sawyers, whatever. Um, we'll just call you Matt Cremona disciples who have decided to start sawing your own lumber. We're gonna talk a little bit about dealing with those logs. But first, as always, thank you to those of you who have decided to sponsor this show over at Patreon, patreon.com slash lumber update. In fact, a few of the emails I, can't, I have today come from those lovely patrons. Thank you everyone for sponsoring the show. You can do it. For a dollar a month, heck, you could do it for a dollar a year if you want. It's entirely up to you. Just uh, it's always greatly appreciated. Thank you. I do want to share a little bit of industry news because, uh, again, got some pretty cool articles sent my way. Uh, Jason sent this in to me, and then uh, like four or five other people proceeded to send the same article. It comes out of The Guardian, and it's referring to um, plywood skyscrapers. There is uh, a town in Sweden... And the pronunciation of this town is a little bit up in the air. Um, the Guardian calls it uh, Shileftia, I think. Uh, and then they go on to amend at the bottom and say, we're not sure that's how it's pronounced at all. But regardless, this town is surrounded by thousands of hectares of forest. And they've determined with this great resource nearby and with a logging and sawing in, uh, sawing, sawyering, sawing industry nearby, they could capitalize on it and do all of their building with um, plywood because they also happen to have a glue lamb plant right there in town. So they have 20 story skyscrapers. They have uh, just about every single building in town is built with glue lamb structures or plywood structures and such. And if nothing else, this article is really cool just to look at for the pictures. It's kind of this like, I don't know, I almost picture it like something out of 1984 without the dystopia, this kind of near future. Everything's very, very clean look, but it's very pretty. There's also some really cool ideas about the structural nature of uh, of wood and of course the highly renewable nature of wood very interesting stuff thank you jason for sharing that article uh, guys go check that out um this one i've been sitting on for a while um lego has wooden furniture now like you can buy a kleenex box that looks like a lego box made out of wood you can buy tables that look like legos and can assemble like legos that are actually made out of wood and this is like full-size stuff not teeny little Legos. Everybody's thinking, well, I've got Legos. I can make a table too. No, this is a full size human sized furniture made out of wood. Very interesting. I still don't exactly know how widespread this is. Um, you know, if it's just in, um, the Netherlands, am I misremembering that Legos a Dutch company, aren't they? Well, regardless somewhere in Northern Europe, I think it may just be there, but, um, I don't know, maybe over here in the States, we can get it as well. Still, it's very cool. And it has the woodworker in me thinking, huh, I wonder if I could build Lego shaped furniture without getting sued by Lego. That is. So let's, let's talk a little bit about logs, um, and, and looking at some of the emails I've got about this. So there's a lot of us, myself included, who have stumbled across logs, maybe laying on the side of the road, maybe a small 36 or 48 inch cutoff laying on the side of the road that's just been left there by like the power company or some municipal contractor that's trimming things along the roadside. I've had a number of trees had to be taken down in my own yard. And I have, uh, in one instance, I had the, um, the uh, Sawyer bucket to length and leave me some like three and four foot long sections. That was red oak. And I actually used that to make a Windsor chair a while back. Uh, I've got um, a Norwegian pine tree that is currently in an eight foot section that I've 
plucked a few pieces off of that and split it apart to make to, to dry for Windsor seat blanks as well. I've also gone out and raided like firewood companies and their logs and just used small rounds like 12 inch diameter and smaller rounds for bowl turning and things like that. This is widespread. I mean, blame Matt Cremona. I don't, uh, maybe he's popularized. He certainly didn't start the whole idea of an Alaskan sawmill. Um, he's just made it really cool and hipster like to build your own sawmill. These urban sawyers, the individual hobby sawyers, I can think of probably 10 or 15 people who are students in the hand tool school who have an Alaskan mill or have property in which they're felling trees from and managing the woodland and they're sawing their own lumber. This has become kind of the next stage. If you want to be a woodworker, if you want to be a cool woodworker, you have to saw your own uh, lumber into boards. Well, the question of, you know, how to saw, it's not really what we're going to talk about here because I don't claim to be an expert on this. Maybe I'll, I'll call Matt up and say, come on the show. Although today I was helping saw up some butternut uh, at my day job, helping by standing there watching, taking pictures, and then moving the slab off the stack and onto the stickers. That was me helping. Uh, I, I wasn't running the saw or anything, but it was certainly, you know, I can call myself uh, a sawyer in that respect. But let's let's talk a little bit further upstream. You know, where are you sourcing the logs? How are you getting the logs? And and what are you doing with the logs? Because there's a lot of care and feeding, if you will, of the logs before you actually saw them. There also can be an instance where, you know, let, let's talk about sourcing them. Um, I found a lot of logs just lying on the side of the road. A lot of times we'll be driving along and I will see a tree that has just been taken down in someone's yard. And a lot of times this is when the homeowner themselves has taken it down um, because a lot of the the tree services will actually go ahead and remove the log. If there's a large section of the log left over by a tree service company, it's usually because it's somebody like me and they've asked them not to take it because they plan on using it for something. But in many instances, say I'll be out for a bike ride or a run or something like that and I'll see these log segments and a lot of times you can just go up and knock on the door and say, look, are you going to use all that? You know, I'm a woodworker, I'm a wood turner, I'm a chair maker, whatever. Uh, I'd love to just have one of those segments. And a lot of times they say, hey, take it. Sometimes the more opportunistic folks will say, well, yeah, 10 bucks. Um, <laughs> those that say 100 bucks walk away because that's just silly. <laughs> logs are not that expensive because there's a huge amount of waste in logs. So don't be talking board feet and any of that stuff. Um, and somebody who does start talking that to you, it's not worth the, um, it's not worth the argument. I get contacted at the yard all the time from homeowners that have a tree that's been felled and they're convinced that it's worth $5,000 or something. Oh, it's walnut. You know, this log is $5,000. No, no, <laughs> it just doesn't. A lot of times the waste factor from log to boards can be greater than 50%. Um, and that doesn't say what kind of grade you're going to get out of that. So looking at current board foot lumber prices and kind of tallying it back to the log, even using a log to board foot calculator, there are those online that tell you approximately how many board feet you get out of it. It just doesn't, it just doesn't work. So logs generally tend to be pennies on the board foot. You know, if you're paying $6 a board foot for hardwood, you'd be looking definitely pennies per board foot in the log form because it's just the sheer amount of labor that has to happen from moving the log, sawing the log, drying the log, stacking the log, all that stuff that happens before it becomes a board. So I digress a little bit. Um, you can go and talk to the homeowner and say, you know, may I take some of that? Other instances, if you find it lying alongside the road, I suppose you could reach out to the county or the city and say, I saw these logs there. Can I take them? I'll be honest. <laughs> I've just taken them sometimes. You know, you pull over on the side of the road and, you know, make sure that you're not blocking traffic or any of that stuff. Hop out, throw it in the back of the car and move on. Um, you know, it's not on someone's private property. It's laying alongside the road. And and I check, you know, if it's a farm or something like that out in the middle of nowhere, it probably belongs to the farmer. And it's still one of those instances where you go and talk to the landowner. But in many public property areas, um, I see this a lot along power lines where the power company just leaves them there. And the power company fully plans on coming back with a different truck, you know, three days, three weeks later and picking them up. Um, I don't think they're going to mind if a log segment is missing. Now, if you went and grabbed everything, they might be happy, but they might be a little upset. So be cautious when you do this. Now, the other method for this is reaching out to the tree removal companies. The guys that you call when you have a tree on your yard that's dying or for whatever reason needs to be moved. 
um, or they get contracted by the cities to remove trees for whatever reason. And if you reach out to them and say, look, I you know, have the ca uh, capability to saw these into boards, I'd love some logs. A lot of times they're really happy to hear from you. Now, some of them may try to sell some logs to you. They generally have a better idea of the market price. Other times they're just happy to have a place to put them. And the problem that quickly develops there is they're getting a lot of logs. You know, they may be going out every single day and taking down one or two trees on a homeowner in, in their yard. Or if they have a city contract, they could be taking down 20, 30 trees a day uh, or at least a week. So they have this huge amount of logs. And, you know, they'll say, if you tell them, yeah, come drop them in my yard, they may show up and drop. 10 logs in your yard and then be calling you the following week saying, we've got 10 more logs for you. And that can very quickly get out of control to the point where then they just stop calling you. You know, you turn them away and they just don't call you anymore because it's more difficult for them to take it somewhere else and wherever they were taking it before. So you have to be cautious there and you want to set expectations. Um, maybe you want a whole bunch of logs. Maybe you want a little bit more variety. That can be a little bit hard to pick and choose especially if they have like a municipal contract and they're taking down trees and they may all end up being the exact same species. If you want a little more variety, the idea there is reaching out to the company that specializes in residential homeowner type tree removal. You can get all kinds of interesting stuff. But then again, set the expectations. Hey, I really just need one log or, you know, how many logs do you have? Well, we have 20, 30. Well, I don't have the space for that. I'd use five of them. You know, and once you start to set expectations, then there may be some money changing hands because now you're asking them to pick two or three instead of just randomly grabbing some and dropping them in your front yard. Um, but at the same time, you know, this can be quite economical if you're buying lumber in log form and sawing yourself and certainly incredibly rewarding. Then, of course, the other method is if you felled the tree yourself, if you have trees on your land that, that need to be managed, you can take them down yourself and, and use them. So now you have the log. What are you going to do with it? So let's kind of jump into the questions a little bit and, and, and talk about this. First one is, uh, this is from Kyle. He says, my apartment complex cut down some large trees late in the summer. I've always wanted to ride my own board, so I grabbed a log about three and a half feet long, 20 inches in diameter. I stripped the bark to prevent pests from living in there. The log is pine and much harder to split than I thought it would be. It's too noisy for me to do on my apartment patio without drawing the ire of my neighbors, so I plan to move the log to a friend's backyard and split it at a later date. How long can I keep my log in log form and it still be viable for making boards? Also, is a ring porous wood easier to split than pine? Because sheesh. So let's address the last question first, Kyle. Um, heck yes, ring porous is easier to split. Pine and softwoods in general do not have pores. And they will split. I mean, grab any, any person that makes firewood and, and use an ax and you can pretty much split anything. It just won't spit split very cleanly. A lot of times it's more of a fracture than a split, you know, and, and I think of something like, like splitting quartz or, or flint or something like that stone where you get this kind of curvy fractured line that happens and there's no specific cleavage plane in that particular stone. You'll find the same thing happens with something like maple or with a lot of softwoods. There's no unified weak point in there that the split will run along. In the case of maple, it's a diffuse porous wood. First of all, very, very small pores, but the diffuse nature of the pores means that there is no clear pattern to those pores. So it kind of doesn't split cleanly. Whereas something like red oak or ash or butternut, uh, ring porous or semi-ring porous woods, there is some order, AKA like perforation lines, weak points in the wood where the wood will split cleanly along those and you can get straight, beautifully riven pieces. Trying to split something like cherry or pine, again, one's a hardwood, one's a softwood, but similar in structure in the fact that they don't split pretty well. Now you can split with a wedge or with an ax, you just might have a lot more run out. So do keep that in mind. Um, the best thing to do there is try to buck that log into as short a length as possible for whatever piece you're trying to get out of it. You know, if you're making, you know, two foot long spindles or something, cut it to like 26 inches long or maybe 28 inches long. The shorter the, the length of the split, maybe the more control you may have over it, the less chance of deviation. But it is a bit of a crapshoot when you're dealing with wood that is not ring porous or at least semi-ring porous in nature. So 
that's the first thing. I'm not discouraging you from trying to split it. Just recognize results may vary. Now, um, how long can you keep the log? Well, the first thing you did wrong, Kyle, was you removed the bark. The bark, I understand your point. I understand what you're saying. The bark is where the insects and the pests and a lot of the stuff would be. The fact of the matter is it's the cambium, the inner and outer cambium layers underneath the bark that have a lot of the sugars and the nutrients in it. And that's really what the bugs are going after. The bugs aren't particularly interested in the bark. The bugs have to bore through the bark in order to get to the sugary sweet stuff in the inner outer cambium and in the sapwood itself. So in some ways, leaving the bark on is rot protection. And, you know, if if you look at a live tree and say you go up to a live tree and don't do this folks, but if you like take an ax and hack a bunch of bark off that section of the live tree, that opens the tree up to disease and the tree can actually die if you hack enough of it away to the point where you, you've left it naked. It's shivering in the cold and it's going to catch pneumonia because of that. Um, not only is it shivering in the cold, it has wet hair, folks. Don't go outside with wet hair. You've left you know, the sapwood exposed for all of the bugs to come along. Um, any of the rot resistance that the bark provides, it's that outer Gore-Tex shell that you've just taken away and that tree will either die or it will quickly kind of scab over in order to prevent infection from happening in that hole you cut in the bark. So when you've felled the tree, leaving the bark on will help that log kind of stay fresh longer. It will also help prevent it from drying and checking so dramatically than if you remove the bark. So Kyle, the fact that you've already removed the bark means that you need to do this pretty quickly. You got to get moving on splitting this into boards and stacking and stickering into boards very, very quickly because it is going to start to discolor, it's going to start to rot um, from the from the the moisture and from the bugs boring into it. Now, some of that could be desirable. Maybe you want some spalt lines, or you want a little bit of mineral discoloration. You could actually accelerate that by removing the bark. But I still think you're better off getting it into board form as fast as possible. And if you want some spalting or some mineral staining, then leave those boards um, uncovered out in the elements and douse them with water and things like that in order to accelerate that rot to which is really creating spalting that's all rot is the next thing that you want to think about is you talk about how these trees were felled in late summer well the the age old adage is you want to fell the tree in the winter in the spring and the summer the sap is rising the tree is growing quickly which means there's a lot of moisture and a lot of sap and nutrient flowing through the tree in the winter it goes into a bit of hibernation that's why we have those darker denser early growth or excuse me late growth rings as we move into late summer into fall and, and winter the tree starts to slow down and you get tighter denser darker growth rings there Um, The tree is essentially hibernating. The sapwood is not full of a bunch of nutrients, just the basics to kind of get by. So when you fell a tree in winter, you don't have a whole lot of stuff that's going to attract the bugs. You're also not going to have a huge amount of moisture that you have to drain and dry out. If it's already somewhat dry, you're going to have a little bit more stable log. It's going to be less prone to mineral staining, to all kinds of extractive staining, and to bugs eating it and causing it to rot. So that's the other thing. Your trees being felled in summer, it's not the end of the world, but it does mean you need to act pretty quickly. The, the longer that log sits around with the sap and the nutrients and the sugars and things just kind of stagnating in the dead tree, the greater the chance of rot, the greater the chance of discoloration, the greater just chance of problems as you're sawing it. You're going to have very gummy saw blades as well, or very gummy wedge um, and axes as you're splitting them apart. And that stuff can actually be quite corrosive when it comes to rusting your tools. Now, this doesn't mean that trees are not felled in the spring and the summer. In the old days when the demand was lower, yeah, you could just do all your felling in the winter and you would do your sawing um, several months later because you focused all of your winter efforts on felling trees and dragging them to the yard and things like that. And then in the spring and the summer, when you couldn't fell trees in your concession, you were back at your mill sawing into boards and such. So the trees felled in the winter with low amounts of sap with the bark on 
weathered the rest of the winter. See, if you fell the tree in, in October, it was perfectly fine to leave it on the ground or leave it in the log yard until you started sawing it in maybe March or April. No problem whatsoever. So half the year, it's been sitting there with the bark on. Now, a lot of log yards these days, because the demand is so much higher, they, they have teams out felling as well as teams sawing, and they may be sawing trees that were felled in the spring and the summer. Now, we know in that instance that you got to move quickly. You can't take that spring or summer felled tree and let it sit in the log yard for a long period of time. It needs to get moved into the sawmill as quickly as possible, debarked um, as quickly as possible to get those bugs and things out of there and moved into the mill. But recently, some log yards have started to discover that when the tree is felled, say, later in the summer, that tree is full of moisture and full of nutrients, and it's quite swollen. Just think about, you know, boards in the projects we may build. We know that in the height of summer, those boards are swollen and as wide as they're going to be. And anything you're building, you want to count for shrinkage in the board rather than further expansion. The log's the same way. It's going to be as fat and as swollen as it can be. Well, as we start to move into the fall and the summer, and as that tree starts to dry out a little bit, it will shrink. And to a certain extent, what happens is the bark shrinks with it. The bark is certainly a lot stretchier and more flexible than the tree itself. It will stick to the tree, and as the tree shrinks, as it loses volume due to water, the bark stretches and actually tightens around the tree and in many ways forms a stronger protective layer. So, you know, the metaphor I used earlier is it's the Gore-Tex shell, the Gore-Tex jacket around the tree protecting it. Now, as it's stretched a little bit tauter, it actually wrings out some of the moisture, but it also allows the moisture to run off and beat off a little bit faster. Um, there's a, a, a talk about this in like drive trains and things like that. The more tension on a drive belt, the more it will shed uh, mud and water and things like that because it, it's literally taut and as mud hits on it, it bounces kind of right off because there's not slack in the belt to allow it to, to, to soak in. It's a bit of a weird metaphor, but the same idea is happening with the bark. And more and more, the sawmills that I visit and the sawmills that, that we buy from day in and day out are saying that they actually like uh, felling trees. If they have to fell trees outside of the winter, they actually like that late summer because then they get that that shrinkage in the bark. It doesn't split, but it stretches it tight and it actually protects the trees for longer. And they can have logs sitting in the log yard for a year, two years, sometimes three years without any particular problem because that kind of extra tight bark really, really protects it. So that's another thing to think about. Maybe if it was felled in the summer, you don't have to overreact and get it into a sawmill as soon as possible. Now, the results are going to vary from species to species, from region to region, climate to climate, etc. You always want to keep that in mind. If you're felling a tree, if you have a log, you want to certainly know what the species is, and then do a little bit of digging. Do some digging on the internet and looking at that particular species, um, sawing species, care of logs of that species. You'll get some good information from sawmills out there and in forums about what success they've had with that. Something like the first one that comes to mind is holly. You know, holly is prized for its extreme white color. But holly only stays white if it is felled and sawn like same day because holly is really prone to fungus um, and mineral staining. We talked about this in a previous episode that mineral staining and fungus can start growing within days of the tree being felled. So you want to get it felled, sawn into boards and into a kiln in order to halt the growth of that fungus and keep that bright white um, nature. At the same time, there's starting to be a market developed for stained holly. Um, and there are some people that are felling holly and specifically setting a log aside saying we're going to sell this as stained or, or gray holly because the market exists and they let it sit for six months to a year before they saw it and they get a very different product coming out of that. At the same time, there are now markets emerging for cherry and old log cherry. That's actually what we're calling it because many of the sawmills have found that when you have a cherry log that's felled and just kept in log form for two to three years, it starts to darken. You know, we all know most wood will darken in the sun, but cherry especially changes colors quite quickly. We start to see the same thing happening as that log lies on the ground stagnant. The sugars and the, the extractives and things in the log begin to um, 
chemically react and transform and oxidize and they start to change the character and the color of the cherry. So when that board is actually sawn, you get a very different character, a very different uh, appearance to it. And it's now known as old log cherry, not old growth cherry, you know, it could be brand new cherry, but it's left on the ground to kind of mature for two and three years. So we have some cherry sawmills that, you know, they're cranking out cherry boards day in and day out. And they have a section of their log yard that is specifically set aside and be left alone for two to three years before they actually saw it into logs. And there are specific buyers looking for that now. So as you can see, there's a lot of variability in this. There is no hard and fast rule anymore of it must be felled in the winter or it's gotta be sawn right away. Results may vary and the character and the resulting product of the board may vary dependent upon when it's sawn. The one thing that is constant though, if you're gonna leave a log on the ground is keep that bark in place. Whether it was winter felled or late summer felled, keep the bark on because it's going to act as that coat to protect it from the elements as much as possible. But I think it's absolutely fascinating how different species are developing different markets based upon how long the log sat around. Another example on the other side of things when you don't want to sit around is maple. You know, maple, sugar maple, it's harvested for maple syrup all the time. Well, if you fell a maple tree in the spring and the summer, you have a big mess and that tree will rot within months if you don't saw it into boards and start drying. You're also gonna end up with a, a lot of problems gumming up the saw blades and things like that. Plus, you're wasting a crop of maple syrup, so most maples are going to be felled in the winter for that particular reason. If for some reason you are a maple mill and you just can't afford to fell everything in the, in the, the, the winter, you are felling that maple in the spring and the summer and immediately getting it into uh, getting the, the bark off, getting it into board form, and getting it into a kiln as quickly as possible because that will attract bugs like swarms, like Old Testament swarms coming out of everywhere, every nook and cranny from states away in order to eat that maple. So yeah, uh, kind of went a little bit off track with Kyle's question on arriving, but it's important because I hear, I've heard, gotten that email from like four or five people about how long is it okay to put, to leave the logs around. So uh, let's see, uh, JK Leho uh, sent me a question about some felled white oak. He says, I felled myself and bucked two 40 year old European white oak trees to save them from becoming firewood. The common wisdom online is you should leave oak logs outside unsawn with the bark on for at least a year. The rationale is that the bark and sap would begin to rot, leaving the more rot resistant heartwood intact while also improving its quality in some form. I haven't seen any reliable sources for this. Is it true? And how does it work if it is? Also, I have no particular desire to let the sapwood rot. I like the way it looks in many types of projects. If leaving the logs unsawn has some benefit, is that benefit realized if I peel the bark off in hopes of preserving the sapwood? I have access to an open bay shed and I could put the logs in to protect them from rain and snow if needed. Alternately, what am I missing if I simply saw the logs into boards right away and just air dry them in a stickered pile? For context, I'm in Finland, so mild summers and long winters are the norm. I appreciate the podcast. Keep up the good work. Great question, JK. And I think, I think we've addressed some of this. I definitely don't think if you're going to leave it in log form, do not take the bark off. And, and white oak is going to have some issues. Uh, certainly... Um, and you know, honestly, I don't know in Europe, I could probably do some digging, but over here in the States, the powder post beetle is still running rampant and the powder post beetle loves the sapwood and loves the inner and outer cambium layers. And it will bore through the bark like it's not even there. So a lot of white oak mills are, are trying to get to board form as quickly as possible even if they want to keep the sap, because there are a lot of people, JK, who agree who with you and really like to keep that, that sap wood. So um, the, the, the issue you have to worry about with keeping the bark on is, is there the presence of any powder post beetles in there? And it can be really hard to tell without at least removing some of the bark and getting into the cambium layer to see those boreholes. So I honestly think with, and, and here again, I, I'm not certain in Europe what the powder post issue is like. Um, do a little bit of Googling in your particular region because it could be different from, from Germany to Finland to France to Portugal. 
So um, take a look in your reason uh, in Finland and, and find out are powder post beetles a bit of an issue or emerald ash borer for that matter. Even though we're talking white oak and ash, the ash borer has been known to go after oak in the absence of ash. Um, birch and beech have their own issues with bugs that could also be an issue with white oak as well. So just kind of bone up on regionally what are the pest problems that you may be running into. The best way to, to do that is to get the bark off and, and get rid of the bark. I grind the bark up into mulch or something like that, but definitely separate it from the log and go ahead and saw it into boards as quickly as possible. Once it's in board form, you can detect active boring insects a lot more. You'll be able to see the bore holes and the little piles of sawdust. So the first thing you do, um, you can, you're not going to really lose the sapwood color or any of that stuff if you saw it right away. Um, you're going to be removing the bark and the outer, the outer and inner cambium layers that have a lot of sugar in it, which will also help protect a little bit from rot. You do want to get it kind of undercover, um, but you could leave it in that open bay and leave it kind of quarantined, isolated from any other boards that you may have and, and wait like two to three weeks and check for signs of boring insects. If there's no signs of boring insects, then you could maybe integrate it with your other lumber and then begin to move into more of a uh, accelerated drying regimen. Whether you want to air dry it or kiln dry it or whatever, um, you want to well, you want to sticker it anyway. And if it's an open shed and it's at least kept from the elements, you could probably keep it there. But you probably want to put some ventilation, some active ventilation on it as much as possible. So there's a couple directions you can go there. I really don't think you're going to be losing much with oak. Um, if you saw it into boards right away, likewise, if you leave it in log form with the bark on, you should be fine. And, and I don't think the one year as a log thing, I don't know whether that really applies that you're, you're reckoning there for let the sapwood rot to keep the hardwood stable. I don't know whether that's really true. I think it's more of leaving the bark on to protect it, um, as it, you know, that bark tightens up and keeps some of the, just the water, from, from staying in it and rotting. Um, if it were me though, because of the pest issue, I would saw it into boards and monitor it closely. You just can't do that. And the worst part is, is if you have bugs while it's in log form, they could just be having a field day, snacking away inside there. And, you know, before you go to saw it into boards and you actually have honeycomb that's just riven with boring trails everywhere. Because once the tree fells, you know, gravity is going to pull all that moisture, all that nutrient down to the bottom, and it's going to be in contact with the ground. You're going to have all kinds of stuff coming up through the, through the, um, through the ground into that sugar. And, you know, they could turn that into pulp really, really quickly. So I think you're better off getting rid of the bark, sawing it into boards as quickly as possible. I hope that helps JK and, and, and good luck. Um, also, if you do find out anything about pests in the Finland area, write back lumberupdate at gmail.com. I'd, I'd love to hear um, just kind of out of my own curiosity. So Joey writes in, um, he's got a uh, sassafras and red oak that he's dealing with. Um, longtime listener and hand school member. Thank you, Joey. I know which Joey I'm talking to right now too. Uh, longtime listener, HTS member, first time writer. I have a friend in Alexandria, this is Virginia, um, who had a huge red oak tree come down recently. She just wants it gone. Do you know any Cremona types in the area who would be interested in taking it? Um, this goes back to sourcing. Personally, I don't, I don't know any Cremona types. There's only, there's only room in my life for one Cremona type, and that's the original, um, the original flavored extra crispy Cremona type. That's, that's enough for me. Um, no, off, offhand, I don't know any, but I know that they're there. Your best bet in sourcing someone that will saw it is go to the sawmills, like the Woodmiser, um, Logosaw, I'm forgetting the other names, the, the individual sawmill type companies go to them. They usually have an operator network, or you can actually reach out to the customer service of that particular company and say, I'm seeking someone in this region. And they generally have records of that type of thing. You can put you in touch with folks. The other thing to do is reach out to the tree removal companies. As I talked about earlier, if you have a mill in order to get logs, call the tree removals. So if you call the tree removal company saying, I'm looking for someone that will saw into boards, A, the tree removal company may actually have that within their own business model. 
and they may be able to help you, or they can point you to someone who does, because a lot of these tree removal guys recognize there's now a market here, and just mulching these logs up might actually uh, be a loss in revenue, whereas they could sell it to somebody who could sell it into boards. So reach out to those guys first. They will give you an idea uh, of what's in the area. The other thing to recognize is there are folks that are going to come to you to saw it, and there are folks that require you to deliver the log to them. Um, and there are some folks that may come and pick it up and saw it. That's obviously going to dramatically change the cost. No one's going to do it for free. I highly doubt anyone's going to just come pick it up for free. There's a huge amount of labor involved and wear and tear um, and liability. You know, the machines that are great for moving logs are not so great on the lawn um, or can have problems with like underground power lines, plumbing, all that fun stuff. And there's a great deal of liability when you go into someone's property with machinery to start removing logs, especially when you haven't been contracted by that company to remove the tree or any of that stuff. So um, be cautious there, but don't expect it to just disappear for free. The other thing you can do is reach out to a local woodworking guild or specifically a wood turning guild. All those turners are going to have chainsaws and they're going to want to come out. And, and he sent me a picture of this. And for the most part, the tree has been bucked into sections. A couple of those sections are four and five feet long. So you're talking thousands of pounds for those sections of trees, many tons for those trees. But the wood turners out there, if you find a local guild, they'll organize a group of folks and they'll come out and buck it into pieces and fill up pickup trucks and probably take it away. In that instance, they would probably do it for free. So that is another option there. Um, you know, I would actually start there because you know it's going to end up in the hands of woodworkers who are as anxious to have this wood as anybody else. So, yeah. Um, he does go on to say, um, uh, I have a huge stash of sassafras and i wonder what your thoughts are on on milling that sassafras is very sweet you know it's wonderful to mill it's wonderful to to, to turn to work um in your shop because you smell like you're in you know a soda fountain or a root beer shop or something like that because of that sweet smell it is going to rot quickly so there's another one where you want to leave that bark on, but honestly, I would get it in a board form and get it out of the element, stacked and stickered and starting to dry aggressively very quickly because it is going to want to bring boards in. But man, what a joy it is to work. I wish I could get more of it locally. Um, it's a relatively soft wood. It's softer than cherry, uh, but harder than you know most of your pines and like cedars and things. I think it sits around 600 on the Jenka scale. I don't know offhand. That's a guess. But man, what a great wood. Um, if nothing else, if you've got a whole bunch of it, uh, he asked, you know, could I build a workbench out of it? My response to building a workbench, you can build a workbench out of anything that you have. Anything you can get easily, build a workbench out of it. The hardness would be perfectly fine. I don't think that's really an issue. In fact, I may be talking about this on an upcoming episode specifically, so I may address that then. But uh, there's another one where because of the sugary nature of it, you probably, I would recommend getting into board form um, Although, you know, I say that and then I think about this old log cherry at the same time and wonder what would old log sassafras do? What kind of coloration change would you see if you you kind of let it steep? That's a good way to put it. Leave the bark on and just let it sit out there and kind of mature in log form. What might that look like? Could be particularly interesting, I think. So anyway, um, the... Uh, I've gotten a bunch of other other emails like this, very, very similar. Um, they all kind of boil down to the same thing of how long kind of leave it around. The other thing that you want to ask yourself in asking that question or answering that question, how long can I leave it in log form is, what do you really want to do with it? Um, if you just plan on making it into boards and you're going to build furniture out of it, but you don't know what, um, that may be one thing to look at. And again, pay attention to the species you have because the answer on how long can you leave it in log form may vary. Like I said, maple, you want to get it into board as quickly as possible. Cherry, you might want to leave it a while. But here's the other thing. What if you actually want to, say, build a chair out of it and you want to do green woodwork from it or you want to do turning from it where you really want the wet green nature of it? The other thing you can do to preserve a log is sink it. Um, if you've got log segments 
Now, you don't want to drop a whole log in there because you'll probably never get it out of the bottom of your of your pond. If, if you're lucky enough to have a pond or a place you can sink it, you want to, you know, cut it, bucket into shorter lengths, um, tie ropes around it, chains around it, you know, something that's not going to rot away or rust away on you so that you can pull it out of the pond and and drop it in the pond and, you know, leave the chain or the rope or whatever sticking out of the pond so you can grab it and haul it out of there later knowing that you're probably going to need a tractor or something like that. But I know a lot of chair makers that they do this. They're able, they get a, um, a maple tree, for example, and they're going to use maple to turn, say, the balusters and the legs on a Windsor chair. And, you know, they got a whole log from the log yard and they only need, you know, to build the next couple of Windsor chairs they have, they only need a small segment of it. So they buck that segment, they split it, and they turn it into to leg blanks or whatever. The rest of it, they don't really have room for at the time. They don't want to split it into a bunch of pieces. They will go and sink that. And that maple that is going to be so prone to rot because of the sugary nature of it is essentially like ensconced, protected in water where it can't oxidize because it's underwater the whole time. The bugs aren't going to get to it. It's, it's like you might as well like encase the whole thing in epoxy or encase it in concrete, except it's in water. And that's going to protect it, but it's also going to maintain the moisture content. When a tree is first felled, it's in excess of 85%, if not 95% water. So as you put it into the, the, the pond, the only thing that's going to happen is it's going to go up a little bit in moisture content. That's certainly not going to accelerate the rotting. Maybe some species you may run into, but case in point, you look at things like cypress or uh, sunken cypress is a whole market. Um, uh, white oak, sunken white oak, sunken mahogany. Um, all of these woods that have in the process of being harvested and floated downstream got hung up and sunk to the bottom and were there for 50, 60, 100, 300 years. And now they're being pulled up and they're being sold, you know, as a, as a specialty product or being sold to the luthiers because of the tonality properties of that. That is a perfect, perfect way to maintain that log. So if you have logs and you leave the bark on and you have access to a pond, sink them and they will keep a very, very long time. So that's the only other um, thing that I didn't really address with the questions that came in as far as preserving these logs. In that respect, as far as I know, there is no shelf life. You can keep it in that pond for however long. Um, just recognize the longer it sits on the bottom, the more force it's going to take to pull that out because they like suck into the mud and the sediment at the bottom and it only piles up around it the longer you leave it in there to the point where you might get to the point where you may never get it out of there again without some sort of industrial crane pulling them out. But man, there's a whole market for sunken lumber as well. So interesting stuff. Um, it it br raises a whole new world of woodworking. And I know those folks that have gotten into sawing their own lumber really, really enjoy being able to work with a piece that they actually have the, the prominence of that or they can remember sawing it into boards. You can only imagine going one step further and kind of care and feeding and maintaining a log yard and kind of knowing that I've got this, this inventory, maybe far inventory of boards sitting on a log yard. And it kind of changes the whole experience a lot. So thanks, everybody. There's probably 10 other questions along this line that I've kind of run together. So thanks to the three folks that I specifically quoted, but all the many other people who've sent in questions about logs. Um, it's fascinating stuff. If you have additional questions around this, let me know. Um, there's a, a there's a lot more about this that I don't know just from lack of experience. I did um, check with several sawmills who manage their log yards and how they go about it. So I've kind of given some results, some answers from this on a commercial log yard talking to some individuals and how they've managed it. And of course, individual chair makers over the years and talking to them and how they manage it. So hopefully my responses are somewhat accurate, but anybody out there who has differing experience or has some anecdotal experience they want to share, I'd love to hear from you. Um, write in lumberupdate at gmail.com or record a voicemail and email it to lumberupdate at gmail.com. And for that matter, keep those questions coming, folks. You can submit them via the contact form at lumberupdate.com or just email. Again, lumberupdate at gmail.com. If you are a patron of the show, I love you all. You can submit your questions the, there as well. And lumberupdate at lumberupdate on Instagram is another way to get in touch with me. I've certainly got some questions that way as well. That's it for me, folks. Don't go buy some hardwood. Go get some logs. Make some hardwood. <laughs>